Hey, today on Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to be talking about the Intel 5960X. Samsung had their big event, the Unpacked event. Marco was there. He's going to be talking about that. And Asus unveils the Zen Watch at IFA. All this and more coming up. It's rock in the bench box. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power. I kind of understand this. Hey, guys, we're back. Uh, this is Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Andrew Zarian. Of course, with me, the two guys from Hot Hardware, the guys, Marco Cipetto, and of course, Dave Alta, Alta Villa. Alta Villa. I want to say Alta Vista. I don't know why. <laughs> I was, you know why? I was reading about the browsers and like, you know, the, the search engines yesterday, and I'm looking at them, and I was just going through all of them, and I'm like, oh, Alta Vista, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know how many times I've heard that in my life? In, Dave Alta Vista? In, yeah. <laughs> the net the net uh guy that i am and yeah if if my last name was alta villa alta vista excuse me um <laughs> I, I i'm not sure I, i'd probably be uh, very wealthy i mean marco chapetta so. is is a much better name because you won't be search you know you, there's no search engine named after you yeah th there's no search <laughs> so engine better? named after me but i got marco polo and then i got all the chia pet jokes so <laughs> i got it from both ends yeah i'll take alta vista any day thanks <laughs> uh, there's not much you could do with zarian i'll tell you that <laughs> well, we'll figure something out. Uh, you know what? Leave it to you guys. You guys will definitely figure it out. There's a lot happening in technology. I mean, I'm so glad the summer's over because for me that, you know, I cover this stuff for news. You guys are busy throughout the entire year because obviously stuff is being unveiled and there's hardware coming out all the time. But for me, this is this is the busy time, you know, big events happening. Apple's having an event next week. Uh, the, just today alone, we had the big Samsung event that was happening, which Marco was at the uh, New York event for that which he's going to talk about but there's always something to talk about and i'm building a new machine here for the studio and when i saw the review you guys did of the intel i7 5960x it really got me interested because this is a powerhouse yeah yeah indeed it is and um you know actually for for what you describe as a workstation system it could very well be one of the best use cases you could think of for for a chip like this so this is Intel's Haswell E architecture. Uh, Haswell is a, is a chip architecture that uh, came out a little while ago, uh, initially started in sort of mainstream and notebook configurations, but now the E for extreme, uh, they've, they've brought out their top end chip, their fastest, biggest, baddest chip based on the Haswell architecture. So Haswell E, it is an eight core, count them, eight real physical core cores on this chip, uh, with hyperthreading, so 16 logical threads of processing available to the user at any given time to the operating system, uh, and clock speed of uh, 3 gigahertz with turbo boost up to 3.5 gigahertz, 20 meg of onboard cache. This thing is jacked, and it is it is an impressive chip. Uh, it is one that really you know it's an expensive chip. It's your it's your basic you know. Bleeding edge Intel flagship chip, which generally costs a thousand bucks out of the gate when they launch these things. Um, but you, if you can justify the cost and the need for this kind of processing power, there is no faster chip currently on the market. And, and they will last you a while. I mean, if, you, if you're if you're going to decide to go with something like this, um, I, I have I have an i7. I have an old, older Gen i7 right now for our production machine, and this thing has lasted us three years. So the investment. Yeah, it's a little little much when you're talking about, you know, the the i7 package and this being on the top of that list. It's a little much, but it's well worth it if if you're doing some heavy duty, you know, gaming or or video processing with it. Yeah, you know, and and that's that's an interesting distinction you make there. Gaming, um, for sure, if you're an enthusiast that you know absolutely makes no compromises in their gaming rig, um, this is a great chip to have. Um, however. I would say that there's some caveats here as well. So this chip, if you if you look through our benchmarks, and we have copious amounts of benchmarks, uh, thanks to our buddy Marco who actually uh, tested and reviewed this chip. Um, if you look through our benchmarks and pour through them, you'll notice that obviously all the multi-threaded performance for anything that's multi-threaded, this thing just is off the charts. It, bl it blows everything out of the water, blows the previous gen 6-core extreme chip out of the water, uh, the 4960X. So anything that's heavily multi-threaded, this thing's going to fly. And certainly in your workstation scenario here in the, in the studio, um, that's a perfect example of, of making good use of all those cores. Gaming, on the other hand, it depends. Again, if you're an, uh, 
you know, no compromises sort of enthusiast do it yourself or that wants to build a, a serious gaming rig. Um, yeah, this chip is the fastest. It may not be the fastest in your particular game engine versus the previous generation chip, however, uh, depending on how heavily threaded the game engine is and um, how dependent it is on cache, because this is a larger cache, 20 meg in this chip versus 15 mega cache in the previous generation chip. But we, if you'll notice, if you look poor through our benchmarks, actually single threaded performance, so single, you know, one core, core versus core performance in this architecture is slightly slower for Haswell E um, versus the previous gen Ivy Bridge E chip. So, little caveat there. Um, but, you know, for, so for all intents and purposes, I, I would say it is, the, it is the fastest chip you can probably get as a gamer in most scenarios. There will be some fringe cases where you could definitely get better bang for the buck, however, certainly um, with other processors, other Intel processors, um, six cores or quad cores even perhaps, with a good GPU, a serious GPU strapped to them, which obviously is really going to get your gaming throughput um, when something's graphically intensive. Very, very cool. Um, I, I got to read more about the the other chips because I just started reading about this one because, you know, I look for the, the best one and then I go down from there to see if it makes sense for me. Uh, very cool. Marco, uh, this is the big story here for me. Uh, I'm a big phone guy. I, I'm a, you know, I get phones all the time. I swap them out. I sell them. I'm doing all this stuff. You were at the Samsung event in New York, uh, which you, you literally drove right back home and got on the air. Uh, you have your badge <laughs> with guy. you. I mean, yeah, it, it, exactly. I, I, I got out of the car, ran in, scrambled, um, sat down, got set up. And yeah, now we're shooting. So yeah, here, here's my, uh, my press badge to prove I was there. My all access media badge from the Samsung event. So it was, um, it was interesting to say the least. I, I went to the Samsung Unpacked event thinking I was just going to see the new Note 4, and Samsung launched three products there, or at least announced three products there. So let me just run through them quick. If, if you're a fan of big phones or phablets, whatever you want to call them, the Galaxy Note 4 is probably going to be the phone for you. It's slightly larger than the Note 3. It's got a 5.7-inch Super AMOLED display. The display has also been upgrading in upgraded in terms of resolution. This is a quad HD display in the Note 4, so a native resolution of 2560 by 1440. Um, up close and personal, screen looked really, really nice. I, I only had it in my hand for maybe 10, 15 minutes. We're going to be posting up some video soon up on the site, but the screen is, is pretty gorgeous. Um, the U.S. version will... It's not set in stone, but this is most likely what the specs are going to be in the U.S. Um, it's a Snapdragon 805 processor clocked at 2.7 gigahertz with 3 gigs of RAM, a minimum of 32 gigs of uh, internal storage, plus all of the goodness the Note uh, is, is known for. It's got the, the stylus, the large display, the air command window where you can open multiple apps at once, move them around the screen. And Samsung also as most cell phone makers do, they upgraded the cameras on both sides of the device as well. So all around, Note 4 is looking pretty hot. I, you know, I've, I've, the Note was a little big for me until I got the OnePlus One phone because that's like, that's a five and a half inch phone. So I'm like, oh my, right. man, this is a perfect size. So 5.5, 5 5 5.7, it really, it, it doesn't feel that big if you're coming, you know, you're gradually moving up to it. I mean, it's, it's a shocker if you have an iPhone and you go to it. Uh, there's a there's a huge size difference there, but uh, a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I'm surprised they, th that the Note was not the only announcement. Yeah, so there's, there was a lot more actually, but just to build off what you just said, I, I was in the exact same boat as you a couple of years ago. When the first Note came out, I thought it was just way too big. Now I carry around a Nokia 1520. It's a six inch. It's huge. And I can't go to anything smaller. I'm hooked on the big phones. But uh, yeah, so the next announcement that came out of the event was the Samsung Galaxy Note Edge. That's now, the one I want. this phone's pretty wild. I've never seen anything like this um, before. So it's basically the same specs as the Note 4. At least it should be when it launches. They're still finalizing the number, so it may change. Slightly smaller main display, 5.6 inch display, still has the stylus. Um, but along the right edge, there is a curve that slopes all the way around to the back of the device. And there is another curved screen there, 
where you, you can pin apps. It's basically like a dock. And if the, the smart cover is closed, it also shows, you know, notifications, uh, the clock, all their information right in that sliver. And to look at it, it's kind of, it looks kind of funky, but to hold it and touch it with your thumb and scroll through everything, I think Samsung's onto something. So when they launched the original Note, people thought Samsung were nuts for making a big phone. I, this this new Galaxy Note Edge got some funky looks, but when you use it, there's some merit there. And one of the other features common to both of the new phones is a new rapid charge feature. You could plug in the, the new Notes and get about a 50% charge in 30 minutes. And it also has those new low power modes like the Galaxy S5, where it shuts all non-essentials down and you can go 24 hours with a 10% charge. So upgrades across the board on the new notes they're they're really cool so the other thing that uh caught my eye with the announcement was that they they announced that they're going to an ois uh, uh sensor for yes. the picture for the camera on these things and uh, i believe nokia is using ois on their on their lumia lines so yes. you're going to get pretty good uh optical image stabilization with this thing because it, it does a really good job at it uh the the rapid charge marker do you know if they're using a qualcomm a uh, chip for that they didn't say specifically they're surprisingly few hardcore tech specs at these events and lots of the people you talk to are more high level kind of features that that they'll give you i, I would assume yes considering it's based on a qualcomm platform so I, I would think so i just i can't confirm for sure yeah i i mean i really like the announcement uh, dave what did you think of it when you saw it? you know obviously you were watching at home but were you were you awed by these two phones that they announced or did you find yeah. the the side i guess the the curved glass on the other one a little little gimmicky for them no i think i think it's it's very interesting to see the edge we've been seeing uh, curved display technology uh teased in the market for some time now both big screen and little screen technology and i think it's I think it's great to see it finally implemented and productized like this. And uh, I would like to get my hands on that thing to see how useful it is. It seems to me, you know, if you if you think about, you know, here I am cradling the phone in my hand and I got my little thumb here for for scrolling that that right edge. What are lefties going to do? That's an interesting thing. You're I'm a lefty. With your in- yeah, I'm a right? lefty. Yeah. So you're going to be scrolling with your index finger, right? might work too but either either way i think it's yeah it's an interesting use case for for um for navigation i i i really like the idea and yeah a few notifications if you have the cover the slip cover shut you can actually see if it's chirping at you that kind of thing yeah i think it could be more than a gimmick it could be could be a really nice functionality to have obviously the white selfie was another big selling point of this thing where you're able to do this panorama shot with the front facing camera it's a wider angle lens on that thing uh, yep. Now, there was also another two more uh, announcements here. Uh, Marco, did you get any on-hand experience with the uh, the virtual re- reality set that they put out? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So the, the other thing they talked about uh, on stage were some uh, content relationships with their, their Milk music service. I'm, I'm going to gloss over that because it was basically just, you know, uh, more refined lists, more music, more relationships. The... The Gear VR headset was another really cool piece of kit. The I don't know if you saw um, iFixit's teardown of the most recent Oculus VR um, dev kit, but when they pulled it apart, there was a Galaxy Note 3 inside it. The screen from a Note 3 <laughs> is inside it. Oh, that's so so there's actually, yeah, obviously, a relationship between Oculus and Samsung going on there. So the, the Gear VR headset basically allows you to clip a Galaxy Note into it and wear it like an Oculus Rift headset. And it works exactly like you'd expect. The one caveat that I thought Samsung made a mistake with, when, when you put it on during in the demo area, you also had to put on a huge set of earphones. They should have incorporated some earbuds right into this one set because when I post pictures, you'll see it looks like you have a, a, you know, a Cylon helmet on when you have all this stuff attached. Oh, man. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. So I guess they took Google's idea from Google I.O. where it was, you know, the cardboard thing. And they took it yep. and they actually did something with it other than cardboard. Basically, <laughs> it, it's it's a high end version yeah. of that. You know, it takes the single display from the note, splits it. And then you have, you know, the, the optics inside for each eye. 
And with such a nice high-res display so close to your eyes with, you know, basically full immersion, it, uh, it, it works. It's, that's all I can say. You know, it was a basic demo, but it, it, it really does work. Very cool. I'm curious. Have they announced prices on this? Um, not that I know of. They didn't announce there. I'm looking at our announcement. It doesn't look like it was in the PR either. I would expect pricing for the Note 4 to be in line with where the Note 3 was when it launched. The Edge will probably have a little bit of a premium, and I'm not sure about the uh, the Gear VR. Very cool. Uh, anything else uh, that you took away from this? Yeah, you know, I think Samsung needs more credit for for innovation. This is a company that is gigantic, yet they'll take risks like this this Galaxy Edge. You know, that's that's a funky form factor, and you know, something nobody else has seen. So. I, I think they deserve a, a little more credit for their design chops than they get. You know, lots of people say, oh, they take what Apple does and just change it. I don't know. They had a watch first. They have this curved display first. They have the big screen first. They have the stylus say, yeah. first. They do lots of stuff that's, uh, that's pretty risky for a big company, and I think it's cool. Very, very cool. Uh, there's also another event happening uh, in, in Berlin right now, and that's... Uh, I was I was reading about it, and there's so much information coming out of this event out in Berlin. Uh, IFA is happening, and a lot of a lot of you know all the manufacturers are there. A lot of laptops are being unveiled, and ASUS had a lot of uh, interesting announcements. Dave, yeah, they did indeed, and uh, we've seen announcements from several manufacturers. If you hit hothardware.com today, you'll see rollouts from guys like Acer, ASUS, Toshiba, Lenovo. I mean. It, there's a lot of stuff coming out at, at Eifer Berlin, in Berlin, Germany uh, today and, and all the rest of this week. So um, that shows clearly, um, you know, getting some traction. Um, but yes, the good folks at Asus uh, did unveil something uh, that we've been looking for from them for a while now. It's, it's their play in wearables. And, you know, quite frankly, I'm a little not so sold on wearable technology. I'll admit that, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, they did unveil the, the Asus ZenWatch, their uh, offering in the Google Wear, or excuse me, Google Android Wear um, product offering. Yeah, that's the, uh, the OS that uh, is running on this thing. It's, um, it's basically, you know, an Android uh, derivative. And uh, a bunch of other products as well, Mimo Pad 7 and a Core M-based, Intel Core M Broadwell uh, based Zenbook UX305 and an EE book uh, X205. So, so lots of portable technology there from the folks at Asus. Let's talk about the ZenWash real quick. And yeah, as I mentioned, it's it's an Android Wear based device, which we think is going to have a lot of traction with a lot of ecosystem partners behind it. Um, the cool thing about this is because it's uh, a standard Android uh, product, uh, will pair to any Android. Uh, 4.3 or later powered smartphone or any any smartphone that's that's running the Android 4.3 OS or later. Um, so that's nice, you know. Whereas you have the folks at um, Samsung, quite frankly, offering their their gear products um, that only pair with uh, Galaxy phones. Um, these will pair with any phone. So that's that's a nice advantage with the Zen Watch. Uh, 2.5D curved glass display. Uh, Qualcomm Snapdragon 400 processor clocked at 1.2 gigahertz, 512 meg of RAM, and 4 gig of onboard storage. So uh, Bluetooth 4, a bio monitor, it's got um, a 9-axis sensor on board, and Gorilla Glass 3. Lots of technology, all that good stuff that you know we're hoping to see in, um, in a smartwatch. Um, but more importantly to me, and this is what I find you know sort of um, you know, the catch 22 with wearables and that is it's aesthetically pleasing. It looks like a traditional watch first and it, and it looks really sharp. Um, you know, I'd maybe prefer a, a nice chunky metal band to go with it versus that leather band, but you know, they can change those kind of options up easily. Um, but the face and the dial is a nice traditional timepiece first. And that's the problem I have with wearables. It's like, wearables need to look good you know google glass is cool and all but you know you walk around with one of those things strapped to your face and you know you look a little goofy you look a little out of place same thing with um a smartwatch that looks really geeky screeny you know i'm i'm a geek first but i want my watch you know, i got a nice big chunky watch here i want my watch to look stylish this looks nice this is a sharp looking watch so 
it's nice to see Asus stepping out with something that uh, is a timepiece as well as a smartwatch. Yeah, I think people are starting to realize that, you know, strapping something that looks like a phone to your wrist with a with a plastic band is not the answer for these wearables. It's either going to be this futuristic band, you know, like the, the, you, you see these uh, mock-ups of what Apple's going to put out, which the yeah, outside, they're probably not going to put that out. But either it has to be something like that or it actually has to look like a timepiece. You're absolutely right. I'm a watch collector. I always buy yeah. watches and I'm more likely to buy this or something like the uh, the Moto watch that they put out that actually looks like a timepiece than I would with, you know, the the Samsung Gear, for example. Yeah, yeah, no, you can, I mean, you can pull it off. You can pull off the futuristic looking smartwatch for sure, um, you know, and have it be, you know, much more digital styled, if you will. Um, but you gotta do it with real good materials and worksmanship, in my opinion, to attract, you know, really what, what, what the market's gonna come in for these things, which is, you know, $300, two, 200 and change on up, um, R Apple's rumored iWatch is going to come in at around four hundred dollars. That's what they're thinking. Um, I think you could you could command that if you deliver a quality watch that rivals a standard timepiece, you know, for for four hundred dollars. So yeah, I mean, and, and uh, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily look all that traditional. Just got to be built well and look sharp. So we'll see. It's it's nice to see um, you know the the. Android Wear watch is coming out now, and Asus uh, stepping into the fray. They also offered up their ZenBook UX305, uh, claimed as the world's slimmest 13.3-inch QHD display laptop. Uh, it is just uh, 12 millimeters thin, believe it or not, and it is powered by a uh, Core M processor as well with 8 gig of RAM. These are all Broadwell, Intel 14 nanometer Broadwell mobile processor, so the next generation beyond Haswell, now in mobile. Um, so absolutely sips power, but offers all of the performance and, and more actually um, clock for clock than the previous generation uh, Intel processor uh, Haswell. This is, this is Broadwell now. So Core M based notebook and it is sharp. Uh, 256 gig solid state drive, 802.11 Wi-Fi, the, the standard put up. Um, but beautiful, beautiful um, thin and lights from Asus. And uh, as well as their um, their EE book and uh, their Mimo Pad 7, they also introduced as well, which is a seven inch Android slate. Um, so lots of good stuff going on. The uh, the Mimo Pad 7 is an is an Intel Atom based machine. Um, this is this is Bay Trail and, um, you know, 1080p display. The nice thing you'll find with Bay Trail, Intel Bay Trail tablets um, is that, um, you know, where you can run Android on it as well as, or there'll probably be a Windows variant. Um, they tend to be very uh, price aggressive. So it wouldn't surprise me, they didn't talk about pricing on this, but it would not surprise me if this seven inch slate comes in at 200 bucks max with a nice 1080p full res HD display. So good stuff. Yeah, very good stuff. Uh, Marco, you had a chance to review the Radeon R9 285 along with a couple other AMD uh cpus now we were talking about intel now we're on the amd side uh why don't you yeah. go ahead and tell us what how those reviews went and and you know what we could learn from this sure before i do that i want to get yeah. your guys opinion on something because you guys were just talking about wearables i i find i agree with you guys 100 percent on on the looks and the aesthetics i find just having them at this point isn't all that useful have you guys seen them either of you see the movie her with joaquin phoenix no I, I have not right. seen that movie. So in in that movie, and this I don't think this technology is all that far uh, off base here. Basically, has a little tiny earpiece, you know, like a hearing aid, un unobtrusive in your ear. You don't see it, and you can basically get all your notifications, voice controls through that. You know, you can get visual notifications from the wearable, but then texts are read to you. You know, you can have it mapped to your voice and run commands. I, th I think that's when wearables are going to get really useful. When it's something in your ear, you can get true notifications without having to look at your arm, grab anything out of your pocket, whatever. What do you, got, what do you guys think of that? Am I nuts? No. Totally agree. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're nuts at all. I mean, yesterday we were t I was talking about this on, on one of my shows where, you know, you look at Google Glasses and, and like Dave said, it's a little goofy looking. You got this thing on your head. You're sitting in a restaurant. It's, you know, it's, it's coming out. It's frame. You know, it's only a frame. It, it looks silly at times, but... The future of that device is not that. It's a contact lens. 
Yep. I mean, that's what it is. It's it, you, you put it in just like a regular contact and you're going to get everything in front of you. And you're right. If you could hear this stuff, that, that also helps. So, you know, I don't know. The, the whole thing with the wearables is, is it, is it the display that's selling it or is it the, the stats and the, and the ability to kind of be able to track everything that's selling it? For me, I, I, I work out. I'm into the fitness devices. For me, something like a little sticker that goes right here that's able to give me all my vitals, that would be perfect. Yep. I don't need a yep. watch, but you're right. I think this these are these are devices that it's going to slowly evolve into, you know, their final form, which who knows what that'll be and or when that will be, you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I don't know. Yep. So, all right, I'm not nuts. I'm glad you guys No, agree. you're not let's, nuts. Let's, let's get back to the AMD. <laughs> oh, stuff. no, you're nuts, so, but we agree with you. <laughs> well, okay, that's true. <laughs> so, yeah, AMD um was nice enough to launch uh, two new products after a, a holiday weekend in the U.S. right after a big Intel launch. So I, I got to enjoy my holiday weekend benchmarking. It was fantastic. <laughs> so they launched the brand new AMD Radeon R9 285 mainstream graphics card and also a couple of new high-end processors. So I'm going to start with the, uh, the R9 285. This is actually a, a brand new chip, brand new product. It's not a, a rebrand. This is a new piece of silicon based off the same GCN architecture that debuted with the Hawaii chip last year in the 290X. But AMD also made some really cool updates. Let me quickly rattle off some specs and let me see if I can do this with my uh, Samsung mode brain right now. So the R9-285, as it's implemented on this GPU, there are 1792 stream processors. It's linked to at two or four gigs of memory via a 256 bus. 256-bit um, interface, I should say. It's 112 texture units and 32 ROPs. The reference spec calls for a 918 megahertz core clock. So, and and I should say, memory is clocked at a, an effective data rate of 5.5 gigabits per second. So you're talking about 3.29 teraflops of compute performance, 102.8 gigatexels per second of textured fill rate. So a a mainstream card, but a high-performing card. Through testing, um, it's kind of its performance profile is interesting. AMD is targeting NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 760. Now, in terms of that target, AMD nailed it. It blew the 760 out of the water across the board. There wasn't a single instance where you can say, oh, the 760 was better. Um, so they nailed it in that regard. But the 285 is eventually going to replace the R9 280, which is based on the older Tahiti chip and slot in just behind the 280X. There were instances, though, where the R9-280 was still faster. So while those cards are being cleared out, you're probably going to find really good deals on the R9-280. And depending on the games you play, the R9-280 may actually be faster. But the 285 is still a great chip. Now, in terms of the, the new features, it's, you know, it's kind of rare for the GPU guys to release new features and keep it quiet up until the launch. But AMD pulled it off with this one. So the GPU on this card is codenamed Tonga. And inside this chip, there are like some new 16-bit floating point and, and integer instructions for lower power GPU compute stuff. I didn't get to test it, but I think that may help guys that like to, to do cryptocurrency mining without sucking a ton of power. But I haven't tested that yet. There is also a new um, memory compression technology, a well, color compression technology that better utilizes memory bandwidth. So even though it only has a 256-bit memory interface, it's 40% more efficient than the previous gen. So that's a cool new feature. There's also a new video block inside this, inside this chip that better handles 4K upscaling, downscaling, and transcoding. So lots of good stuff across the board for a $250-ish graphics card that's probably one of the more future-looking products on the market right now. And that's a great price point. That's a phenomenal yeah. price point. For for what it does, it's it's competitive. Like you, you can get GTX 760s right around the same price, maybe fifteen twenty dollars less. But at two fifty, you won't get a better performing card across the board with all these features. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that's actually a really good, really good buy. Um, now you also reviewed two AMD uh, CPUs. Yes. The CPUs are cool, but not quite as exciting. So 
AMD launched the brand new AMD FX 8370 and the 8370E. Both of the chips are based on the, the existing pile driver architecture. The only difference with the 8370 versus the previous high-end, the 8350, are clock speeds. The 8370 has a base clock of 4 gigahertz with a turbo clock of 4.3. The 8370E has a base clock of 3.3 gigahertz and a max turbo clock of 4.3, but its allure is that it's, it's compatible with uh, 95 watt platforms. The 8370, like the 8350 and, and older FX chips, are 125 watt chips. So if you had you know, an existing AMD system that could only accommodate 95 watt chips or below, you couldn't get to the high end without replacing your motherboard. Now with the 8370E, you can do that. So if you want a full 8-core AMD chip for your rig, but you know don't have the funds to rip everything apart and replace your motherboard, you now have an option in the 8370E. Very cool. So how does this, what, if you were to compare these two chips to an Intel counterpart, who would it compare more with? Which chipsets? Um, it's tough to exactly say, but <laughs> I can, I'll clarify. It's tough because... Loaded question. It's yeah, a very the, loaded question. <laughs> AMD's single core performance has been their Achilles heel since Bulldozer launched. So core for core, clock for clock, and Intel core is just way faster than AMD core. However, at these price points, 199 bucks, this is an eight core chip. So even though they don't quite have the same IPC as an Intel chip, for more parallel operations, sometimes they're better. So in terms of dollar for dollar fighting, you're talking like a Core i5 4670 range, and the Core i5 4670 will will smoke these chips in lightly threaded apps or gaming, but in highly threaded apps like video encoding or uh, rendering, like in Cinebench, the extra cores can overcome the IPC deficits and you know perform a little better. So it depends on your workload. Um, it's about in line with the Core i5. If you want a killer, no compromise system, that's going to be a Core i7 no matter what. But for a mainstream rig, Core i5 level, these are good options, especially if you work with heavily threaded apps. Very cool. Um, interesting because, uh, you know, we run AMD machines for our Skype machine. So we're always looking to, you know, see what's next for us when, we, when these go out and they die yep. out. Uh, and I'll probably stick you, with AMD because they're inexpensive and they, and they work great and you're getting a lot of cores with them. Yeah, the thing with AMD, you know, if you look at the processors, their price competitive may be a little less than Intel. But when you factor the whole platform, like AMD motherboards are usually a couple bucks cheaper. Coolers are a couple bucks cheaper. Just overall, yeah, you can save a couple of bucks. And I'm not sure you can do this, but do you guys run like multiple instances of Skype on your machines or is it just, you know, one instance? So we one? used to do that, but now we're running one instance. We have four different okay. Skype machines now. All right, gotcha. So if you're doing that, you'd probably be better off with it with an Intel machine, but to, for dollar for dollar, you, you won't go wrong for Skype. Obviously, anything can run yeah. Skype. <laughs> so some of the questions that we always get uh, here at GFQ, uh, a lot of people are looking to get 4K monitors. Uh, people are taking that next step with more 4K content being available, and you know Netflix is going to be streaming at 4K. A lot of people want to know what kind of display to get, and... You guys featured the Sam a Samsung 32-inch uh, UD970, and this possibly could be the one. Yeah, we actually, and, and I figured I'd just toss this one in here, and we all can sort of uh, chat around it a little bit. But Marco and I, over the years, have, uh, you know, sort of had a, you know, a hankering for big panels. We do a lot of work all day long. We're, we're sitting in front of our machines writing up uh, content, editing content, testing, all that stuff. And we both over the years of upgraded monitors several times. I'm currently running a 30 inch uh, Dell right now, standard, you know, 2560 by 1440 display. Um, Marco, I think you're up to a 4K display now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, we're, we're always looking for what's that next, you know, crown jewel of a monitor that we must simply have in the workstation. And uh, yeah, we, we posted something up today, an announcement from Samsung that could be a candidate for that. I'm, I'm not sure. It's a 32 inch 4K ultra ultra HD monitor, the UD 970. Um, it's pretty gorgeous looking, and Samsung, God knows, knows how to put together a panel. 
this is a low glare, love to hear that, PLS plane to line switching display with a resolution, native resolution of 3840 by 2160, 178 degree viewing angle, 10 bit true color support, and 100% um, sRGB and 99.5% Adobe RGB color gamut specification. So that's pretty good. This is a professional, what you call a professional grade monitor. That, that color gamut spec is critical. It's critical for guys like us that are always working with web content, especially where you want to make sure across screens your color is accurate, you know, displaying content across multiple different screens, multiple different viewers. And uh, so this display is, is set up for that sort of precision. It's really nice. Um, eight millisecond uh, response time, gray to gray response time. Uh, pretty quick. Might be maybe not the fastest for gamers, but um, I think it's a, a single. What, are they, what do they call that technology to get the, four play, the 4K input? Single scan. Single what is it? Transport. IPS. Single, single stream, stream transport. transport. ST. <laughs> that, I always forget that acronym. So, yeah, basically, you don't have to – it's not actually two panels in one to get that 4K resolution. It's a single panel with a single stream, data stream, uh, that would communicate to it from your graphics card. So you don't have to worry about panel synchronization within the panel. It's one big, clean PLS display. So I have a 27-inch here. Um, I'm actually surrounded by monitors. If you look here, I have a 24-inch, I have a 19-inch, I have a 27-inch uh, Dell IPS that I just got. But you got that boat anchor right in front of you. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I got a boat anchor. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a nice, that's a nice. You know what? This thing, this thing might as well have been a boat anchor because I spilled water all over this last week and I had to replace the keyboard. So it was it was submerged. So it kind of works. Fixing board blinking though. I mean, he's pro looking. Look at that. There's a lot going on here. But for someone that <laughs> someone that wants to buy this monitor, is it is it necessarily would they would they be happy with this monitor if they got it for gaming, or is this more of a uh, you know, media consumption type monitor where, you know, you get a very nice picture, very high quality picture on this. So Marco, I, I have wanna, lots wanna of that? I have lots of opinions on this. Can I can I jump in? Please do. So I'm going to say something controversial that you wouldn't think a, a hardcore geek like me would say. I think most people would be unhappy with 4K right now today. And I, I'm going to explain why. In terms of the pixel gorgeousness, they're freaking awesome. Uh, I have, I have, I'm looking at a 32-inch 4K display in front of me right now, and it, it's beautiful. I absolutely love it for its, you know, the pixel density. This particular panel is an IGZO display, so it's color reproduction is great. It's nice, even, um, you know, even whites. It's beautiful. But there's so many little quirks that I think would drive people nuts. So for gamers, for example, you need some serious horsepower to smoothly game at native 4K resolution. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing to consider. So there's the, the MST and SST thing that Dave had mentioned. Only a few of the newest monitors are SST, single stream transport. That means Windows sees the display as one large surface. All of the older ones are MST um, displays, so it's two lower resolution screens combined in a single panel to act as one display. And you get all kinds of quirkiness like that. You know, sometimes you'll boot and half your display is lit, half's not. You'll enter your BIOS and it's squished to half of the screen. You're watching a video uh, and, you know, dragging a window across your screen and it loses sync for a second. Tons of just weird little quirks that are annoying. Um, and all of that adds up to, you know, a diminished user experience. But the worst part about it is there's tons of apps that aren't quite ready for high DPI on Windows. So you'll go to launch, yeah. let's say, you know, Adobe Create. I, I don't know if it's fixed in, in CC because I'm not a subscriber, but Creative Suite 6, for example, Adobe Creative Suite 6, none of the menus scale even if you up your, you know, up the display scaling in Windows. So your menus are super, super tiny. Or you'll get programs that do scale, but it's super fuzzy and doesn't look right. There's tons of software work that has to happen to make 4K perfect, and there, it's not perfect yet. So if you're an early adopter and you don't mind working through that stuff, they're awesome. It's, I, I love having all these pixels. If you want to plug something in and not worry about it, you might not be happy with 4K. And then the one final point you had mentioned, you know, there's more and more content coming. That's true for, for, for movies. 
but on the PC, all of your content is 4K. You can already do 4K resolution on your desktop. You can run your games at 4K and get the benefits of those, you know, increased number of pixels. So when people say there's, you know, not a lot of 4K content, they're only talking for consumption. For for work, everything is already 4K. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now you guys, you guys gave away a phenomenal phenomenal gaming system uh you guys had a had a had an uh, i'm looking here and i'm really jealous actually i'm quite jealous of the person who won this uh you guys announced the winner you you do this in during the summer you guys held this event uh, i think this is the second time that you know that i've been working with you guys that you guys have given away a really nice uh system here and the uh winner was announced on the website yeah marco's gonna uh marco's gonna be building this up so i'll let him talk to the uh to the build and the internals but yes we we typically will run almost once a month a, a giveaway of some sort. Sometimes it's a gaming rig give, giveaway. Sometimes it's tablets. Um, other times it's components. You know, we we tend to give away a lot of gaming rigs though because a lot of a lot of folks in our audience uh, are do-it-yourselfers and can appreciate a well-built gaming rig. So we did have our summer gaming rig sweepstakes with EVGA. They they were one of the partners that helped us get together the components. For this build, and uh, Marco is gonna is gonna piece that bad boy together with an immaculate build quality, right, Marco? Yeah, that's the plan. So we we've announced the winner, but I haven't had a chance to build it and ship it yet. So if my office wasn't such a disaster, I I would pan right and show you the pile of hardware that's you know just over my shoulder. But um, I'll be a little too embarrassed if I turn the camera right now. So yeah, we have this awesome thermal take case, Intel Core i7 4960X. Um, Beautiful EVGA components, motherboard, uh, GTX 770 graphics card, 1,000 watt power supply, um, memory, and an SSD from Kingston. Basically, all of the best stuff, or at least one notch down that Haswell E has launched. But all of the best Ivy Bridge stuff available is going to be crammed in this rig. I'm going to build it, shoot a video, post it up really soon, and get it shipped out to Ben, who won it. That is awesome, uh, and you're going to be. You guys are announcing something soon for another giveaway, right? Always another one coming. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Always Not another. Not quite sure yet. <laughs> you know, we we tend to uh, connect pretty well with the folks from Nvidia. Maybe we can talk them into getting us a bunch of Shield tablets. Ooh, ooh, that'd be nice. <laughs> that'd be cool. That would be nice. We also um, we didn't finish the planning, but AMD's committed a, a handful of their best processors to give away not full systems but processors and coolers so we're not sure the order how all this is going to happen you know my cousin my cousin uh james zarian might have to enter into these contests <laughs> get him on the I'm site and tell all his friends to come too <laughs> these are this is awesome uh very cool uh it's the end of the show guys but where can people reach you how can people get in touch with you where can people go obviously hothardware.com for all things that have to do with uh, hardware with computers, uh, components, phones. You guys cover everything. It's one of my favorite websites actually to go to. Uh, there's a couple that I visit every day, and honestly, bef even before I knew you guys. Uh, so this, this, you know, you guys aren't paying me to say this, but I always go to Hot Hardware <laughs> to find out what's happening. Uh, it's we it's a phenomenal pay you site. To say it if we had to, though, we if you had to, them. you would. But you, you're not paying me. I mean, we're amongst friends. I'm a big fan of the site. So uh, uh, obviously, HotHardware.com. But where else can people go? Sure. So you want to go to twitter.com slash hot hardware. You want to go to facebook.com slash hot hardware. Pretty simple stuff, actually, if you think about it. And uh, let's see, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. That's our channel. Subscribe, please. You're probably watching this very webcast on that uh, medium. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash hot hardware vids to get all your uh, moving pictures of us. Yeah. Very, very cool. Marco, any, anything, any final words from you? I don't think so. I'm pretty fried, man. This is, I had to leave the house at a quarter, you know, a little after six to get to Samsung's event, and I scrambled home in traffic to get here for this. I am going to make myself a cup of tea and relax for half an hour. You know, if I knew, if I knew you were in the city for the event, I would have probably gone to the event. I, I was invited to go, and I didn't go. Oh, I should have went. I know. I should have gone. We could have run into each other and acted surprised. There you go. What are you, what are you doing been here? I'm jealous of that nice beard you got there. Yeah, it's coming in. It's coming in deep. All right, guys, uh, that's it for this week's show. Tune in. Uh, next week, again, we'll be on uh, GFQLive.tv. We'll keep you posted on the date and the time. I think we're going to stick to the schedule. Uh, Wednesdays are a pretty good day for, for me, and, and I know you guys, uh, Wednesdays work for you. So 
Uh, stay tuned. We'll also post it on our website. Uh, and, uh, of course, on our Twitter, GFK Network. We'll have it there whenever we go live. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Take care.